Section 1.4 very excitedly gets into some of your trigonometry. Uh, the first few aren't bad at all. Uh, the uh, first one here is asking us to find the angle between 0 and 2 pi that is equivalent to 25 over 2 pi. Okay, so what I just thought in my head is, well, 25 divided by 2, that's 12 and a half pi. So I know that that is 6 revolutions and then pi over 2, because 12 pi is the same thing as 6 revolutions around, and then it's pi over 2 more. So in order to get that into standard form as far as showing out my work, I just said, well, it's going to be 25 pi over 2 minus 6 revolutions, which is 6 times 2 pi. And I can say, well, that's going to be 12 pi, which is the same thing as 24 pi over 2. 25 pi over 2 minus 24 pi over 2 is pi over 2. So what that means is that 25 pi over 2 and pi over 2, they're just coterminal angles uh, on the unit circle. And in this case, we say they're equi an equivalency. Uh, all right, so number two. It's asking us to convert these values from radian to degrees. And you can see the work or the, the answers I've, I've done there. Let me just go ahead and cover that with the work because that's what matters on, on these problems. So all of these were given to us in radians. So I just take the radians and I can say, okay, if I want to get rid of radians, then I need to divide by pi radians and multiply by its equivalents in degrees, which is 180 degrees. So 4 over 7 radians is 4 over 7 times 180 degrees over pi. And then I just went to my calculator and it said two decimal places, so that gave me 32.74 degrees. Keep in mind, you don't have to enter in the degree sign in your answer because they have it and it's very hard to see, but it's at the very end of each of their answer blanks. So no need for you to worry about that within the answers. The second one here, same thing for all of these. We had six pi over seven radians. What is that in terms of degrees? So you'd say, well, okay, uh, six pi over seven times 180 degrees over pi. And we can then say, we know that our pi's are going to cancel. So this is just six sevenths times 180 which gives me 154.29 degrees. Uh, for the next one here, we had eight fifths of a radian. And I can say, well, if you have eight fifths of a radian, the corresponding degree uh, measure for that is gonna be eight fifths times 180 degrees over pi. Uh, and again, you just go to your calculator, eight fifths times 180 divided by pi and you should get 91.67 degrees in this case. Uh, the, the next one you should know, uh, two thirds of pi, we can say, well, that's just 120 degrees, whether you just automatically know it, which I hope that's the case, or you multiply it out like this. Uh, now, the next question gets into arc length. You might remember from pre-cal, that arc length S is just equal to R times theta. So it's equal to the radial length times the angle subtended from the central angle. So you could say, well, now, please don't be misled in this problem. I, I at first was a bit misled because their angles are not drawn to scale. They say the angle alpha is only 0.4 of a radian, but then they say the angle phi is 10 times that size and it's four radians. Clearly, these angles are not drawn to scale. Uh, angle phi here may, may, may look twice angle alpha, but certainly not 10 times the size of angle alpha. So just kind of ignore the looks of it and go with what they give you in the problem. So I know arc length is equal to the radius times the angle that's traveled. And I can say, well, if I want to find arc S1, well, it's going to be the radial length 4 times the angle alpha, and I know the angle alpha is 0.4, so S1 is just 4 times 0.4, I get 1.6. Now, the other arc down here, S2, it has the same radial length 4, but now the angle phi is given to be 4, so you have 4 times 4 is 16. So, according to the formulas, 
uh, arc length S2 should be 10 times the size of arc length S1, uh, 16 versus 1.6. Now, we know that that's not the reality of how they appear here, but that is the answers that achieve is wanting. They just did not draw it to scale. Uh, for our next question, it's saying, uh, suppose that the cotangent of theta is equal to C and that you know theta is an acute angle. What does the sine of theta equal in terms of C? Well, let's see. <laughs> so if you take a look at this, I just said, well, the cotangent of theta is C. So I know that means the same thing. C is the same thing as C over one. You can make anything a fraction as long as its denominator is one. All right. So then I know that theta is an acute angle. So I drew an angle in quadrant one. And then I can say, well, what do I know about theta? Not only do I know it's an acute angle, but I know that the cotangent of theta is equal to the adjacent over the opposite. Remember, tangents opposite over adjacent, your SOHCAHTOA, right, right angle trigonometry. Well, cotangents, the reciprocal of tangent, tangents opposite over adjacent. So this is adjacent over opposite. So I went ahead and labeled this triangle. The side adjacent to theta has to be C. The opposite side has to be one. Then I know that the hypotenuse has to be the square root of this side squared plus this side squared. And I can say, well, then it's the square root of C squared plus one. Now it's asking what the sine of theta is. We know that the sine of theta is just the opposite over the hypotenuse. So one over the square root of C squared plus one. And then you see you have the answer, gorgeous. All right, up next. Uh, five kind of continues along that same line of thought. It tells you that, it, or it asks you to find the values of the sine of theta and the tangent of theta if the given value for the cosine of theta is eight over 17. And again, you know that theta is an acute angle in quadrant one. So I went ahead and drew out theta, an arbitrary angle in quadrant one. Now, what I know about uh, theta is that the cosine is 8 over 17. So that gives me adjacent and it gives me hypotenuse. I go to my triangle, I label the adjacent, I label the hypotenuse. And then I can say, well, then the opposite side is just the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the other leg squared. Give me 17 squared minus 8 squared. That's 289 minus 64, which was 225. And then the square root of 225 gave me that value of 15. You might have just recognized, ooh, John, that's an 8, 15, 17 special case triangle. And if you recognize that, ooh, fantastic. No big deal if you didn't, though. Now, when I go in and answer my question, I need to find the sine and the tangent. Well, I just look at my triangle now. Sine is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse, 15 over 17. Your tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, the 15 over 8. And you can see, that's the two values I put in on the problems on Achieve, and Achieve liked it. For number six, again, continuing with this same line of thought, we once again know that theta is an acute angle, but this time uh, we're asked what the sine, the secant, and the cotangent are equal to if we know that the if we know the tangent. So. Given that I knew what the tangent was, I automatically knew the opposite and the adjacent side of my triangle. So I went ahead and labeled my triangle. The opposite is four, the adjacent is three. Now, I also recognize that as a perfect, uh, as one of our special case triangles is a three, four, five triangle. Uh, you could have also used Pythagorean theorem and said that this is the square root of three squared plus four squared, which will give you nine plus 16 is 25, square root of 25 is five. So however you get the hypotenuse, you need to get that, that it is five, and then you can go in and solve their question. The sine of theta, opposite over hypotenuse, four fifths. Now, in order to get the secant, I just went ahead and did the cosine first and said, well, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, three over five. The secant's just the reciprocal of that, so it's five thirds. And then of course the cotangent we always know is just the reciprocal of the tangent. So it had to be three fourths here. Now, if we look at, trying to make that a little bit more clear, that's better. If we look at number seven here, 
seven continued this line of thought. Uh, oh, actually it didn't. It's a cool problem too though. Uh, for number seven, it said that if the cosine of, or sorry, find the cosine of two theta, if the sine of theta is 3 thirteenths. Okay, so in some senses, it did continue this same uh, line of thought, but what I had to go do is go back and remind myself of a Pythagorean identity from Calc 1, sorry, from pre-calculus. Uh, and if you don't have this one memorized, it's not the end of the world, but you do need to be able to use it if given it. Uh, I'm going to use the identity, the cosine of two theta is equal to cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Now you might recall there's two other identities for the cosine of two theta as well. You can say, well, it's one minus two sine squared theta or two minus uh, cosine squared. There, there's, there's three of them there, but this is the one I typically use. It doesn't really matter. They all, they all work. But now, when I'm using this one, I can say, this is going to allow me to find the cosine of the double angle, even though I don't have any information about the double angle. I use the information about the angle theta. And I can say, well, I know that the sine of theta is three over 13. So the side opposite is three, the hypotenuse is 13, which means my adjacent side has to be the square root of 13 squared minus three squared gives me 169 minus nine, which was 160. Now that square root of 160, I just went ahead and simplified in my head as the square root of 16 times the square root of 10. Square root of 16 came out as a four. And I say, well, that's better written as four on the root of 10. Now I go back into my problem and say, well, the cosine of two theta. Now, if I were just looking at this, the cosine of theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. I get four on the root of 10 over 13. I need the cosine squared theta, which kind of makes it irrelevant that I simplified this out. I could have just left it the square root of 160, and then when I squared it, I'd have got my 160 back. Uh, but I think it's good to go ahead and simplify that anyway. Uh, I put in the cosine, the adjacent over hypotenuse, I have to square it, minus the sine squared. Well, we already knew that the sine was 3 thirteenths. We'll have to subtract that quantity squared. So this first group, when we square it out, and again, it might be easier if you just left it the square root of 160. Here, I'd have to say, well, four on the root of 10 squared, that's gonna be 16 times 10, which is 160. My denominator, 13 squared is 169. My, my, minus my second one will be nine over 169. So we know when we subtract that out, we'll get 151 over 69, uh, and that will be the cosine of twice the angle theta for this problem. And you can see that the fraction is what achieved once. It doesn't want you converting that to a decimal. Sometimes it will say decimal approximation. In this case, it wanted the exact answer. Uh, and then the next one, it wants the exact answer too for number eight. Uh, it's giving you that the cotangent of theta is nine over two, and it tells you that the sine of theta is negative. It's asking you what the cosine is. Okay. So when I thought about this, and when you think about this, you first have to say, well, this is not like before where you could just draw an angle in quadrant one. You can't, because it tells you that the sine of theta is negative. Automatically, that tells me I'm in quadrant four or quadrant three. Now, clearly, I drew it in quadrant three. How did I know that? Well, because the cotangent is positive. The cotangent is only positive whenever the sine and cosine have the same sign. Both sine and cosine are negative in quadrant three, thus the cotangent is positive. If I was in quadrant four, the cotangent's negative. So I'd go ahead and draw out my trig triangle in quadrant three, and the angle always has to be uh, between the hypotenuse and the corresponding x-axis here for your angle theta. My right angle is always going to be drawn right on the x-axis as well, and I can say, okay, Here's my triangle. How do I label that triangle given that this must be the angle theta? Well, I know that the cotangent is going to always be the ratio of the adjacent over the opposite. So now please be careful here though. You can't label this side nine and this side two. That's not the case. This is moving to the left, so it's negative nine. This is moving down, so it's negative two. 
And then your hypotenuse, of course, when we square those, they don't, the negatives don't matter. You'll just get 81 plus four for the square root of 85 for the hypotenuse. Now, it's asking me the cosine. Well, the cosine of angle theta, cosine is always equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So I get negative nine over the root of 85. Gorgeous problem. I really like that one. I hope you do too. Uh, so please make sure you understand what I just explained on number eight. That's an important problem. I can see myself putting a problem like that on a test. Uh, number nine here. I'll move this back up. Yeah, there we go. So for number nine, the problem on achieve, I'll move that down just a bit. It said, again, uh, we're going back to assuming that theta is an acute angle in quadrant one. And you're supposed to find the sine of the double angle and the cosine of the double angle if the tangent of the angle theta is 8 fifteenths. So given that the tangent of theta is 8 fifteenths, I went ahead and very quickly and easily labeled my trig triangle. I can say, well, tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. And this is one of our special case triangles, an 8, 15, 17 triangle. Otherwise, you could say your hypotenuse is the square root of 225 plus 64, which would be the square root of uh, 289, square root of 289, 17. So then you can say, all right, we have our triangle in there. What are our two formulas? Now, I'm hoping you know these formulas, but again, if not, it's not the end of the world right now. Uh, I would like you to know the double angle formula for the sine and the double angle formula for the cosine. I'm not saying I wouldn't provide them on a test, but they're, they're formulas that you really should know. Uh, but it's not a huge deal if you don't. Uh, and before we have our test, I would tell you if I would be giving you those in a trig problem or not. Uh, now, up in this one, the sine of two theta, it's equal to two sine theta cosine theta. Now, looking at my triangle, I know that the sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, 8 seventeenths. My cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, 15 seventeenths. I multiply across, 2 times 15 is 30, times 8 is 240. I'll get 240 over 289. Uh, my cosine of two theta. I can say, well, that's just cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. We saw that on a previous problem. So I'll get 15 over 17 squared minus 8 over 17 squared. That gives me 225 minus 64 all over 289, which simplifies to be 161 over 289. Uh, now, from those, our last two problems have us thinking about the graphs of trigonometric functions. Before I show the options here uh, in number 10, let me explain how I would like you to be able to graph these. So it asked me to graph the function f of theta is equal to three sine of two theta. Now, could you pull out a graphing calculator? Sure. Should you need to? No way. Uh, now, the reason I say no way you should not need to is simply because of how these are going to be worked. All you really should know is what the base function looks like. You can say, well, the base function for the sine function, I should always remember, sine of zero, zero, sine of pi over two is one, sine of pi is, goes back to zero, three pi over two, negative one, two pi back to zero. I just think of the values in the unit circle, plot them out, and I get a nice smooth curve here. Now, if that's my one period of my base function from zero to two pi, I think about what's happening or happening to this function. Well, what is that two theta going to do? What I need you to remember is anytime something is in with the independent variable, if whatever happens to the independent variable happens to that number, then it's always a horizontal change. And it's a horizontal change that always goes in the opposite of what you would think. And if, you, uh, if you're remembering what I'm talking about, back when we were shifting parabolas and I said, what's the difference in y equals x squared and y equals the group x minus five quantity squared? And you'd say, well, x minus five quantity squared shifts the parabola y equals x squared to the right five units. He said, oh, instead of subtracting five units from the x values, you add five units to the x. Exactly. 
In the same manner here, if you have a term multiplying the theta in there, then the actual thing that you're going to do is you're going to divide all of the x or and I should say theta values by two. So this is going to horizontally compress our function by a factor of two. So whenever I'm looking at this, I can say, well, one period did fit between zero and two pi. Now one period is going to fit between zero and pi. So I would just take the values that I had, that same graph that I had right here, and change these values. This one becomes pi over four, pi over two, three pi over four, pi. That's all I did right there. That is one period of this sine function, but it wants us to graph it from zero to two pi. So you just say, well, then the second period is going to do the exact same thing from pi to two pi. So that would be the sine of two pi. Now you'd say, well, but this is multiplied by three. Well, that's just an amplitude stretch. So instead of oscillating from negative one to one, it's going to oscillate from negative three to three. That's all I said there. It's going to look the exact same thing as this, except to be stretched vertically by a factor of three. So I know that the function I'm looking for needs to go down to negative three, up to positive three, and it needs to be shaped like this. Now, I go back to my page, and you can see the one that I chose. Now, why is this top one not correct? And the reason and it, it isn't is, please notice, it range, it, its range, it goes down to negative two and up to two. This one doesn't have the correct starting point. Uh, this one, uh, its uh, period is too uh, quick in through there. This one looks, well, obviously this is the correct choice. It's the one that I chose and it was correct. You have two full periods between zero and two pi, and you have a minimum of negative three there and a maximum of three, good stuff there. Uh, but now I really think it's best if you could have just given me that graph out by hand. Uh, number 11 here. We're not graphing on this. This, this actually goes back to uh, the earlier problems where it's giving me information about an angle theta and then asking me to find other values. It says if the sine of theta is less than zero. So that tells me theta is in quadrant three or theta is in quadrant four. Now find the value of the tangent when the secant is the square root of 35 over three. Cool stuff. So what did I do? I did this right here. I said, I know that the secant of theta is the square root of 35 over three and that the sine of theta is negative. The fact that the secant of theta is positive tells me that the cosine is also positive because remember cosine is just the reciprocal of that. And so I can say, well, when is the cosine positive but the sine negative? Quadrant four positive x, negative y. So then I can say, all right, uh, if I look at what I'm given, and I'm going to think of that as the cosine of theta is 3 over the root of 35, then I can say if this is my angle theta, and I should have drawn my angle theta in right there, and I'll draw it in right here. Oh, nope, that's a green marker. I'll draw it in with a black marker. There's my angle theta. So if the cosine of theta is three over the root of 35, well, you can say, well, then the adjacent is three, the hypotenuse is the root of 35. And now your opposite side, because it's going down 100%, has to be negative. And that's why our sine is gonna be negative here. It's gonna be opposite over hypotenuse. Well, that opposite side is gonna be the negative of the square root of, this side squared minus this side squared, well, that's going to be 35 minus 9. 35 minus 9 is 26. The length of this side has to be the negative square root of 26, which that doesn't simplify since it doesn't have any perfect square factors. When I go back to my problem, it wanted to know the tangent of theta. Well, here's theta. Tangent should be opposite over adjacent. Negative square root of 26 over 3. And you can see that that's what I entered in and uh, achieved like that answer in exact format. So please don't put any wimpy calculator decimal approximations for that one. All right, guys, that'll do it for section 1.4.
i hope this trig stuff makes sense let me know if you need any help i'll be glad